So I'm here with Wes, codename Wesley Thunder. That's his stage name. Um, professionally, well, we won't get into that. We're keeping his identity a secret. He is in the witness protection program, right. um, which, as you can imagine, would be very stressful. And he did put on some weight because of that running from, you know, I won't say who he's running from because that would give it away. But um, he is wearing a Cleveland Browns shirt. So, you know, he's some sort of low life criminal. Um, that would have given it away either way. Anyways, I'm very happy to be here right. with my client, Wes. Wes uh, emailed me earlier today saying that he was having a recurring issue with anxiety that all kind of revolves around his weight loss efforts. So I was thinking about starting a podcast. Wes emailed me and I'm like, hey, let's do this. This wants to happen. So I asked Wes if he'd be willing to share this you know, session, whether it's a full hour long session or, or we do 15, 20, 30 minutes, I don't know. <clears throat> um, but he graciously is willing to, you know, step into the public light of all 12 people who will probably watch this episode. Uh, but still, it's it's admirable. And Wes has a big heart. And I know he he uh, is happy to, you know, share his journey because it'll help other people as well. So with that, Wes, Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Easy Way Out. <laughs> really happy to be here. Okay, great. <laughs> that's that's the podcasty stuff out of the way. Um, just, just because right. we will get into sort of a normal flow eventually here. Um, but uh, just for the sake of people who don't know you and may not even know me, um, I am a weight loss coach. And how long have we been working together? Uh, since the beginning of January, so about five or six months now. Oh, wow. Okay, great. And yeah, yeah, it has been a while. Um, it's been a very fruitful five months. It seems like you've really come a long way internally, and that is showing itself on the outside. Mm -hmm. Um Again, if anybody is new to my coaching philosophy and methods, it's very much based on helping us get out of our own way and make weight loss easy. And I didn't title this podcast specifically anything to do with weight loss because as you can see, the things we'll talk about in this session, even though I don't exactly know where it's going to go, you can probably see how it would uh, reach across different areas of life. So with that, we will now resume normal coaching session parameters as if this is not being recorded. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so you want to fill me in a little bit on what's been going on? Yeah. So um, I've been struggling with a lot of uh, anxiety and, and panic um, since we've kind of started this journey of um taking away food as my false sense of security. And there's been a lot of anxiety kind of creeping in. And it seems that I'm having a hard time trusting myself and trusting my body that I'm okay when it's trying to tell me otherwise. Um, there are moments when it seems um, like I can manage it and then I can kind of stay, stay present. And then there are just some moments when it, it, plays its hand back at me and ramps it up quite a bit and kind of stirs me into thinking that I'm not sane enough or, I, you know, I'm too crazy or, you know, or, or it's, it feels so real, you know, that it's kind of hard to stay present. Um, and that's kind of been a roller coaster up and down on its own, but for the last probably about three nights, um, it's really kind of reared its ugly head a little bit. It's interesting how you phrase that because it is a bit like playing a card game like magic where you are, you know, casting spells at one another and ultimately trying to defeat the foe. And it can easily feel like like it's a tactical battle, a tit for tat. And when in some ways that is what it's like and in other ways that can be a limiting perspective. Just one thing, um, mm -hmm. can we back up a little bit and just... Uh, for the audience, how in, in our last session, we talked about this a lot. So this is our second bite at the apple mm -hmm. um, with this particular topic. 
just in case, you know, so for some people, they're not going to immediately understand the connection between uh, weight loss and hypochondria. So could we maybe just fill in the dots for them a little bit about why we think that this is heavily tied to your weight loss efforts? Um, so there was, I don't know how far back I can go, but there was a time when I, this whole anxiety process was kind of getting started. Um, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Like I actually, I went to the ER once and they were like, you're fine. I finally started, uh, seeing a, a doctor regularly. They hooked me up, said your heart seems fine. I did a sleep study from had an EKG hooked up. Your heart's fine. Um, but I know that based on what we've talked about, that it's there to hinder my progress. It's there to bring me back to where it, wants me to feel like I'm safe where I was. So I'm, since I'm trying this new thing or I'm stepping out into this journey, my survival brain wants to pull me back into where I'm, where it thinks I'm supposed to be the status quo. The status quo, because, uh, the survival brain always sees the status quo as preferable because we haven't died yet. So mm-hmm. it must be inherently preferable. Um, and this is obviously a hugely limiting factor in cognition. Now it's important to note one thing you left out. Uh, one thing that helped me identify that this was related to weight loss is that when you were having these panic attacks, you were walking, correct? Ah, yes, that was, yes, very, yeah, I forgot about that. That was when it had started. Yeah. I was out for a walk and that's when the first big one hit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And walks aren't a super common thing for you. It's something where you're, you're getting out of your comfort zone, so to speak, or especially where at mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, so what were some big takeaways from our last session that you've been trying to employ? Um, so, uh, when we were having our conversation about this last time, uh, you know, you had mentioned, uh, you know, kind of staring these anxieties and these things kind of right in the eye and being bigger than them. I think that's kind of the the phrasing that you use. You know, you are the space in which these mm-hmm. things exist inside of. Um, and sometimes that's a hard concept for me to grasp. And it's something that I'm that I'm trying to to do, you know, like, OK, this is happening inside of me. It'll be OK. The other thing that you said, which blew my mind, which I thought was really funny that, uh, made me feel at ease for a while was, you know, when my mind's playing tricks on me and it's like, okay, uh, you're about to have a heart attack. Okay. Um, just let, okay. It's going to happen, I guess. Uh, all right, let's have this heart attack. And, and as soon as you said that I, I told you, you know, like, I can't think of how many times I thought my way out of a heart attack and that's not how it works, you know? Um, but I've done it. Like, <laughs> like I, I have, yeah. I have tricked my body with my mind to not have the heart attack that I thought I was going to have. And the issue that I'm having now, and I've tried to do that a couple of times when it's coming up, I'll just say, okay, whatever, you know, like let's do this. And that helps sometimes. And then sometimes my body or my mind will do more things to make it seem more intense or more real. And then that kind of breaks that Mm -hmm. away. So it's still something that I'm practicing and working on. Um, But there have been moments where it's helped. Yeah. And that's, um, that's totally normal. I, I know what you're talking about when you say sometimes when you face these things down, it just immediately um, takes the legs out from underneath it. And it's, it's almost comical how fast it just all falls apart when you're just kind of shining a little bit of truth, um, at the situation and you see how rickety the logic and the, just the thinking is behind these fears or our other idiosyncrasies and survival mechanisms. But other times your, your emotional state is, we'll say triggered for lack of a better term. It's a, it's a wildly overused term. But when I say that, I I mean, Mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, traumatic stress triggers where when we're not talking about, Oh, you had a bad day at work and now you're traumatized. At least that's what you're telling people on Twitter. We're talking about unprocessed childhood stuff, um, which we've both talked about. We know it's there um, for you. 
And when we get triggered, our our right side of our brain, certain emotional centers in that brain, um, where memory is processed to some extent, um, it's also where a lot of our creativity and our imagination lies. So that's why it's kind of a, a hotbed for anxiety. Um, not only is it a place where we can imagine very doom and gloomy futures in, in granular detail, but it's also a place where we can call up memories, not not necessarily just the you know the pictures and images and sounds and smells that we remember, the sensations, but but the embodied memory, the memory of what it felt like to go through those things, because that's ultimately the deeply the most deeply rooted artifact of those traumatic events is the unprocessed emotion about the event. Um, and because that exists in your mind presently, when, when that gets electrified, gets powered up, it, anybody who, who deals with PTSD um, knows that a flashback doesn't feel like a flashback. It doesn't feel like a memory. It feels like something that's happening right now. And so as powerless as you ever felt in your entire life, that's what's coming up when you're feeling this way. Mm. Um, so it makes sense that you wouldn't have the um, analytical apparatus to pick that apart. But also, even if you did, um, when you're triggered, you, you can't talk your way out of it because we're talking about a part of the brain that is upset. And this part of the brain evolved far before the um, emotional and the more evolved emotional part, our linguistic parts of our brain. And, you know, it's the part of our brain that we, it's the part of our brain that we share with, uh, you know, cold blooded lizards, right? It's the snake brain. Um, it's that's where our fight or flight centers live. And yeah, so it's all, it's all intertwined. And when you're having a traumatic memory, it's not a memory. It's an, it's a present experience that you feel stuck in. And you're also turning off, a, you're, you're not turning it off. Your brain just turns off this part of your mind that senses and has a context of time, specifically the duration of time. So that's partly what's screwing with your brain is that not only are you feeling powerless, like you're being waterboarded, you know, by hypochondria, it feels like it'll never end. And that's a, that's a key part of the traumatic memory that, you know, often gets overlooked is that feeling that, no, you can't just outlast this. You can't just breathe and, and wait for this to go away because this is endless or your experience of it is endless. So, um, that being said, also your other cognitive centers, like your sense of self, your, your executive function, your ability to see yourself and moderate your own actions, your linguistic center. So your ability to put your emotions into words and to be able to talk to yourself, these all get downregulated massively when these other centers are lit up like a Christmas tree. So it kind of makes you a little bit brain dead. And that's why trying to, you know, mind your way out of your feelings is no good for a number of reasons. So partly what we're doing here is to try to use tools to make you more capable in those moments of steering yourself away from this emotional um, dysregulation and this these triggery events to be able to let them pass, to be able to, you know, find emotional ways of being a context that can calm the situation down, because the, the best path into these things is through the emotional realm. But obviously that's the, that's the hardest, right? No one wants to hear that, but, um, that's what you're experiencing when you, when you see the reality, cause that's what it is that you are bigger than these emotions because you just have to be, you're the, you're the context in which they were formed, that they've lived and persisted in which they crop back up. So you're not trying to convince yourself of this. You're just trying to appreciate the reality of it. And so that's one advantage that we have is that this story is is manufacturing a story and it's trying to twist reality to make a point 
whereas we have reality on our side. So we don't have to produce a counter argument to these anxieties. We just have to let reality be present to as many parts of our mind as we can, especially the emotional mind. So that's a long winded way of saying that sometimes trying to, you know, like I said, mind your way out of this, like think your way out of these things um, can just make it worse. If not, you know, certainly it doesn't always help or we're not capable of doing it or not always. Um, sometimes trying to think your way out of it can just deepen the notion that it is a fight of some sort, that it's a, it's a, it's a you or me. And it's very easy to feel like hypochondria is trying to kill you, that it's, because I mean, that's what it's trying to make you afraid of, right? So it's not a huge leap to be like, this thing is dangerous and wants me to die. When in reality, it actually wants you to live. It just sees you trying to live a better, healthier life as an affront to, as we mentioned before, the status quo, which it sees as the pathway to maintaining existence, maintaining survival. So does anything, anything, but before I keep going, rattling on, does anything there jump out to you in your experience? So the, the thing that I think might be good to talk about if in my instance and for anybody listening is if anybody is like me um, and we've talked about this too, my fixer attitude or my, you know, the, the cost management, is that the, the, the cost magnifier? Cost magnifier. Yeah. So in those moments when it feels like, um, you know, heart attacks intimate or the anxiety or the panics really ramped up, if we're not to think our way out of it, what is the other alternative? What is like in a scenario like that, what is a person to do? Are we just to, you know, cause it's so hard. I think it's very difficult to just let that happen or let that be. And I know you say to let reality, that's our, that's kind of our trump card is, you know, the, to, to be in reality. But when, how do you, how, how are your sensations that you're feeling or what's going on? Not a part of that reality. How do you, I guess, separate the two? That's kind of what I'm struggling with. Yeah, that's a really good question. <clears throat> because in a sense, your emotions are real. They're more real than your thoughts. They're more objectively real. Because if if a cougar jumped out of the woods, you would have an emotional reaction to that. It doesn't require interpretation or meaning making. That would just be a visceral reaction as real as the cougar itself. So in that sense, mm -hmm. our, our emotions are part of the reality that we want to accept. And so the answer is not to run away from these emotions. Um, and this is why we don't need to flee or fight something that we are bigger than, right? So when we can connect to the idea that these things are not bigger than us, they cannot hurt us, no matter how good they are at, you know, casting that spell, when you can connect with that, that's why it's so incredibly powerful. It's like seeing a cougar jump out of the woods, but then realizing that, oh, it's a trick of the light, making you think it's a cougar and it's actually a house cat. No one's really that scared of a house cat, right? Okay. So let, let me kind of draw a picture here. I want to use an example so that you can like feel the difference. So kind of let, let's not imagine you, but let's imagine Joe, right? Joe's having uh, an anxiety episode, uh, hypochondria. It's at nighttime, which is a time when he has a hard time winding down from the day, right? If you have a hard time dealing with your hypochondria, you probably have a hard time dealing with other stresses from the day and not knowing what to do with them. Um, so there's a connection there that we could probably get into as well, uh, which is fairly obvious that a lot of times the hypochondria is just a, your system using a different route to try to bring up certain situations that are not being dealt with elsewhere in life, that other situations during the day are triggering this deep seated, um, you know, fault line. And in that context, you know, trying to lose weight or make other changes on an already stressed and sort of unseen system 
is that's why it can seem like such a threat to to the status quo to our you know equilibrium. So let's say Joe, it, for whatever reason, he's in a state, and you know it's nine o'clock at night, and he's he usually goes to bed about ten, and he doesn't really know what to do with himself, and he's you know he's trying to use his tools, but it's just not working, and he's just kind of going into that dark place where he's he's got the cold sweat going, he's got the like the visceral fear, like gripping his chest and his guts. And Joe's favorite band is, I don't know, what's a popular band? What's your favorite band? (laughs) I mean, I don't know if they're popular, but my favorite band is Dance Gavin Dance. I've never heard of it, so. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Dance Dance, Gavin, dance. Yep. What kind of music is that? Oh, they, it's a lot of different stuff. It's mostly like, uh, it's very melodic, but it's also very kind of metalish. you know? Uh, they, they do a lot of different hmm. styles. That's kind of why I like it. Uh, and they've got a, okay. they've got a great group of musicians. It's pretty technical. So. Oh, that's cool. should check that out. Do you like polythia and stuff yeah. like that? Like math rock. I don't, so yes. let's say Joe is a huge poly, polyphia fan, right? <clears throat> what Tim Tim Henson? No, oh, is that the whatever that he's the, he he looks like he's twelve, but he's just Asian and he's the, aging very well, and he's actually like twenty eight. <clears throat> but he's a sick guitar player. So let's say polyphia pulls up in their bus outside Joe's house at nine o'clock at night. You remember, like back in the day, those MTV things where like Metallica would show up at someone's house. You know, I remember they did that one time. And uh, so let's say this happens to to Joe, the Polyphia tour bus breaks down outside his house and they're like, Hey man, can we come hang out with you and jam for a bit? All of a sudden his favorite band is in his living room rocking out. Does Joe still deal with the hypochondria at that point? I would assume not. Right. So, so therefore, if there's a big enough distraction from the hypochondria, no more hypochondria. Hmm. So part of the power and part of what is keeping us stuck to the hypochondria is an inability to disengage. And this is why trying to fight the hypochondria or any anxiety just keeps us engaged, which if we're engaged, it's quicksand, man, like we're never going to win that game. So a lot of people's tools, they they deploy them in a form of engagement, kind of trying to fight the anxiety on its own level, which you're just, you're going to get your butt handed to you every single time. And when we have tools, we want to use them to disengage from the anxiety, to diffuse, um, which in this context means to, you know, to like, like fusion and diffusion, to separate from. Um, and diffusion is really important. It's an important concept in mental health, especially in acceptance and commitment therapy, um, where you're able to draw the dividing line between, let's say, where in your body you're feeling an anxiety and where you're not. And just to notice that boundary as a way of beginning to see the, the, the difference between you as the space or the body versus the you that is experiencing anxiety. So it's very helpful, first off, to notice in your body that, and I teach this with hunger management, right? With hunger anxiety, that if you focus, like let's say you're feeling hungry and it's like really making you like create, like you're gonna go off your diet, you're gonna eat the arm of your chair if, you know, right? If, if something doesn't get resolved. I teach people, and I've probably taught this to you, like locate the hunger in your body with as much specificity as possible. So it may start with like, okay, where's the hunger, right? And it's it's just all over your front, right? Your face, your, your throat, your, your chest, your stomach, the fronts of your legs, your shoulders. And then you say, okay, it's kind of all over my front, but where is it really? Is it really in my, my front deltoid? And it's like, no, it's more down, right? And by doing this, by following it, you get down to a much more focused area. And so just by 
tuning our awareness to the pain. It doesn't amplify the pain. It minimizes it. It shows us that the actual discomfort we are feeling, and it, it, in this case, it's a uh, it's partially maybe physical hunger, but it's partially an emotional reaction that that is mimicking hunger, which is very common topic for many other podcasts, right? Um, but when we're having, let's say, this emotional pain in our body, by turning our attention more fully to it in a spirit of just noticing, we're not engaging yet, right? We're just watching. We, we actually minimize it. We take it from being all over our front to it's, it's really just right there in my stomach, right at the top of my stomach. And so where was I going with that? What were we just talking about? Obviously before that, uh, uh diffusion hypoc- tools yeah. and disengaging. Oh, diffusion. Yeah. 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 yeah Distraction. Yeah. So now, now diffusion gets to be that much easier, right? Because I'm not trying to like disengagement doesn't mean that I, I tear my stomach out of my body. So I stop feeling this pain because that would obviously cause more pain than it would remove. Disengagement is being able to be with the pain. And we've talked about this before. When I tell you to be with certain emotions, we're getting here more into what that actually means, right? So by being with the pain, we actually minimize it. It allows us to sit with it in a space of compassion. And it it allows us to draw that line between the pain we're feeling and us as the space. I, I'm not hurting. I'm not feeling this hunger in my entire body now. I just feel it in my stomach. And the more I'm willing to feel it where it is, the less I, resi- the less I resist it. And the resistance is actually what was causing the referral pains all over the rest of my body. Those pains were real, but it was the pain of the whole front of my body trying to make my stomach stop hurting. The, a slight tension, right? Just trying to make an emotion go away. So this is why, you know, in Buddhism, they talked about, they talk about how, um, what is it? Uh, attachment is suffering. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that, especially in this line of work. I definitely tell people that resistance is suffering. Res- resistance to reality is suffering. So and again, this will point back to the effort of, you know, diffusing or dissolving the anxiety or stepping away from it. We'll bring it all back and bring all these threads together. Thank God for editing. I can edit all this out. Isn't that great? <laughs> I can yeah, take a minute yeah, yeah. and just like let my brain coalesce. It's like the the Terminator, you know, it's like sometimes my brain is just like <laughs> trying to do 50 things and it's just little puddles of goo on the pavement. But then I, it, if I just let it, it will, you know, coalesce into um, a killing machine sent from the future. That's Which right. is... Would it be yeah, a Coach John station without a solid brain. movie reference? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> this Terminator is here to heal you, not kill you. That's right. That's um, right. So, right. So the, we're touching on a lot of really big topics like awareness. And, and so if you're listening to this and you're like, oh my God, I can't even keep up. What does that word mean? What does that word mean? You, 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 you define this other word, but in so doing, you brought up three <laughs> other words that I want you to explain. Um, we can do that in due time. Um, and I'll give you ways to contact me at the end of the podcast. So I'm going to try to bring it back around. Bring it around, John. So yeah, that's that's one big note that I want you to think about in the, the coming week is notice where the hypochondria is in your body because it's not just the mental gymnastics you're going through to try to negotiate it or mitigate it. There's a physical aspect and the physical aspect is you're increasing your suffering by actually resisting the pain of the original anxiety, right? So there's the anxiety and then there's the resistance pain, right? I'm just making up terms now, but it makes sense. Man, 
We should really move our sessions to earlier in the day this summer because <laughs> my brain will work so much better. <laughs> I'm oh, free. Golly. You just tell me what you need. Yeah, that's one good thing about summer. When does school get out for you? Uh, oh, sorry. It got when, out. when does the factory? <laughs> yeah, uh, it got out May. Hold on. So it's out. May 25th. Yeah, May 25th was our last day. Right on. So this kind of, there's so many different directions I could go from here because we could talk about being the space, right? But I think we've kind of touched on how being the space is in some ways learning to diffuse, learning to draw the dividing line between the anxiety and you. It does not require us to get Mm -hmm. rid of the anxiety to, to massively mm-hmm. downgrade the amount of suffering we're in. And oftentimes the amount of suffering that's, that is real is far more manageable than we thought it could be. But when we were, when we were being unaware, when we were being resistant to it. So this is the beauty of acceptance. <clears throat> it, it sucks, but guess what? It was already going to suck if you didn't accept it. Acceptance of reality doesn't bring any more cons because like we, we stub our toes into all those, you know, coffee tables when we're unaware, it's all the same, right? It's just that when we bring in awareness of reality, it doesn't make life harder. It makes it easier because all of a sudden we can see the opportunities available to us, the positives, not just experiencing the negatives. And so that's very true of accepting anxieties in all their forms. The other sort of The other sort of dovetailed piece of this Venn diagram that I'm trying to draw is what we could call distraction. Obviously, we don't want to distract away from our emotions. However, we all know that distracting, we all know that distraction, oh, come on. (laughs) We all know that distraction can instantly kind of pull the plug on certain anxieties, at least for the moment, right? So our our metaphor before, um, Joe, his favorite band pulls up in front of his house and all of a sudden his hypochondria just simply cannot compete for his attention. So obviously that's an extreme example, but so how can Joe disengage from the hypochondria in the same way without distracting from the emotion at its core. A big part of it is the minimization that comes with acceptance and and awareness and being with it. Another piece of it is non-engagement, non, what's the word? Like non-violence or like non, yeah, basically I'll just call it non-engagement. That's good enough. It's a policy of, I'm not going to try to fight you. I'm going to walk away. So when, when I was going through the worst of this in my own life and it pops up here and again, um, I learned and it, and it really made me kind of upset because I, I'm, I love having a plan. I love winning. I love, I love competing. Right. And I, I can so easily get sucked into a competition with these things. I want to, I want to outduke them. But sometimes, you know, when it's getting toward the end of the day and my brain is just still, it just, I just cannot get it to, to let go. I remind myself like, man, just shut it down. Just shut your brain off. Stop thinking. And it is amazing how well that works. It's not easy, but the more you do it, the better you can get at it. And the quicker you can get to that place of really quieting your brain down. So this really helps us in accepting the emotion because the thoughts are not the emotions. And this is another really big concept when it comes to um, managing anxiety. Um, And especially managing a lot of the anxieties that pop up and derail people's weight loss efforts. So by realizing that we are not our thoughts, right? We're, We're not our feelings and we're not our thoughts. But the thing about feelings is that as we discussed, they are more objectively real than the thoughts, because the thoughts are all extrapolations of the real emotions. They're, they're all the, the interpretations of what these emotions mean, right? So a lot of these, the thoughts that have to do with hypochondria 
is us trying to think our way out of the hypochondria. A lot of the hypochondria is our response to the anxiety. And our brain is trying to trying to convince for and against at the same time, which exhausts us. And we're literally like playing both sides of a chess game. And when when you can when you're in a competition with yourself, you can see the other guy's game plan. You can see what they're gonna do. And and they can still do it. It's it really drives home this delusion that you are these different beings that are at odds. And in some ways, you do have different aspects of your psyche that are trying to pursue good things in life very different ways, in ways that are not compatible. However, the truth is, at its core, these entities are part of you. The part of you that wants to go for a walk and eat oatmeal and lose weight is the same you that wants you to think that you're going to have a heart attack so you'll stop going on walks and stop eating oatmeal and go back to eating pizza every night right and that we it serves to mention that we talked about this a lot in the last session that hypochondria right what it's really trying to do is get you to think that you're going to die right what's the point of all this does hypochondria ever actually kill anyone no it just convinces them momentarily that all is lost. Their future is doom. What is the only logical reason to do that? To, to make you think that it's simply not worth putting in any effort to make your life better. It is a form of, as I've mentioned before, the cost magnifier. It is trying to tell you that it is simply not worth any investment in your health because your health is a lost cause. You're, you're investing in Enron, you know, like it's gone, man. Like that's no, no investment into that is going to, is going to pay dividends when the truth could not be further from that. I want to kick it back to you for a minute. Um, is, is any of this creating sort of a, a, a cohesive picture or is it too much rambling and <laughs> rabbit trailing. No, no, I, <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. Um, the, the thing that I don't think, um, I've done specifically when it comes to disengaging, I mean, I, I obviously the last couple of nights haven't even really been able to disengage very much just because of how intense everything feels, but the specifically where it is locating it, um, I think I've been able to get it to a, a bigger area, kind of like how you said, you know, the front of your body as opposed to that. But to even sit down and think um, or even just stay, I don't know, I guess relax is enough, you know, might be the way to go uh, to even find that, just locate it, center it. Um, that's something that I haven't really been able to do very much of or at least think about. You know, sometimes in these moments – what I probably need to start doing is taking my notebook to bed with me and setting it right beside me. So that way I can kind of go through these things a little bit um, just as a, just as a refresher to kind of remind myself of, Hey, you know, when I'm in this moment, because when these things pop up, I just, it's, it's like my whole world. Like it's just everything that I know right now laying mm -hmm. in bed is, you know, I'm trying to fight this right now. I'm in the fight of my life. I, I constantly say to you, i I, I keep going 12 rounds every day, you know, and I, I hate that it feels like a fight because I know it's not supposed to feel that way. Um, but when it comes to survival, uh, or thinking that it's survival, when you put those, the cost magnifier, when you put that pressure on yourself to do that, um, I know that that can obviously make it more intense than what it needs to be. Um, but boy, I mean, let me jump in there for knowing where that's, that's yeah, really yeah, good. Sure. Stuff. Go ahead. Just, and just for a little bit of context for people listening, the cost magnifier is a term that I use to label a function of your brain that tries to shut down your innate motivations, passions, impulses, and all that. I teach people how to connect with their innate motivations so that they don't have to be trying to conjure up motivation or 
take someone else's motivation and try to make that their discipline and it, just get carts before the horse in so many different ways. Um, and the cost magnifier is one of the chief mechanisms that keeps us penned into our status quo along with shame, which again, you're going to be like, whoa, hold on, man. Shame is not there to make you feel bad. Shame is there to get you to not do stuff. And namely to do that by getting you to not see your survival mechanisms in action, right? So it gets you to shut down your innate impulses that are reflective of your deepest values and who you really are. And it's the vehicle that keeps your compulsions hidden from your sight. It's the vehicle that keeps you from being aware of these invalid, these these mechanisms with invalid logic at their heart that are trying to keep you quote unquote safe when really they're just trying to um, distance themselves from the discomfort we have over certain feelings. Again, if you have questions about that, I'm sure we'll talk about that more in future podcasts. But so, yeah, now back to what you were expressing about, you know, nighttime and uh, basically being present, how difficult it is to be present and be in mm -hmm. quote unquote reality. So one thing that's interesting to note is that like nighttime in, in our psyche, nighttime is scary, right? It's not just little kids. It's not a childish thing to be, it's not a childish thing to be afraid of the dark. The dark is the unknown. And as we all know, humans are afraid of what they don't know. And this is why we're happy to project our past over and over and over again, just to prevent having to enter into the unknown. Again, one of the main reasons why we stay stuck. So this is a part of the reason that these things crop up at nighttime. Also, because it's the end of the day. And as you said, you know, if, if we have a way of going through life that is working, is pushing water uphill, you know, fighting that something that does not need to be um, a war, um, then that's the logical place where we would be the most stressed out before we get any rest. So... <clears throat> You know, if these things are happening at nighttime for, for anyone listening, n understand that that's fairly normal. And that, that can be one more level of normalization of all of this and being willing to feel what you're feeling. Be like, yeah, of course I feel this way at the end of the day. This is the end result of a lot of other malfunctions in my thinking and survival mechanisms and thought patterns that I'm not even aware of yet. And that in time, picking those things apart will help prevent these bouts of anxiety from ever being able to develop. So that's part of the, the good thing about acceptance and doing this work is that eventually we just prevent these episodes. Um, but they do sneak up from time to time. And when they do for me, I'm going to give you a little bit of a playbook that you can write down in your notebook, right? Because again, when you're in those moments, logic and reason don't really help. But what we want to do is be present while diffusing from the anxiety. So what that looks like oftentimes is take a breath. One of the biggest things that anxiety does is try to convince you that you're dying, right? And this can happen with all forms of anxiety, uh, especially with hypochondria it will take control of your breath. If you let your this part of your nervous system control your breath, it will be shallow. It will be um, it will lower your heart rate variability. These are all things that are signs to your brain that you're in danger. So your nervous system is actually creating the danger for the rest of your brain to freak out. And it's it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Luckily, we have control over our breathing in a way that we do not have over even our heartbeat or our digestion. Um, so we can switch on our, we can switch off the autopilot and take the joystick. And this is one of the biggest avenues we have for being more present and creating a little bit of elbow room for us to work, right? So you can start just by, you know, breathing a little bit deeper, a little bit slower, a little bit more controlled. And it, it will feel very uncomfortable to do so, but when you keep doing it, it just, it always starts to send the signal back to your brain. 
hey, everything's okay. So just by breathing and doing so long enough, you're going to start to turn down some of the alarm bells going off in your brain. Next, you can implement things like tapping, right? You can tap, you can cross your arms and tap on your shoulders like this, um, or you can tap on your legs, right? You can um, sometimes doing so, you know, bilaterally where, where you're tapping and then tapping and then tapping and then tapping left, right, left, right, left, right. Or you can just, you know, at the same time tap and anything where you can feel a sensation in your body, it, it gives you something else to think about other than your anxiety. Remember that movie with Damon Wayans, uh, major pain when, uh, somebody's like leg hurts and he's like, I know what to do. And he like breaks your finger yeah. and, and it makes yeah. your leg stop hurting. Yeah. It's that's basically it, right? It, it is true. That's a real thing by implementing a small amount of pain elsewhere. You can anesthetize other parts of your body. This is partly because our brain has a harder time experiencing pain in multiple locations all at once, like sight pain, right? It's different than referral pain or um, resistance pain. Uh, and also there is there is an analgesic effect to feeling pain. This is why people will cut themselves. This is why people will harm themselves physically because it can kick off endorphins and and actually in, engage some of the brain's natural pain relief processes that can help mitigate emotional uh, pain or pain that's presenting physically in the body that is rooted fundamentally in, in emotions. So um, yeah, pain can be an analgesic, a, a pain reliever. It's, it's incredible. Also, being scared can be a pain reliever. Feeling anxiety can kick up some of the um, adrenaline responses and adrenaline is a numbing agent. If you've ever, ever been in a fist fight, you don't really feel the punches when you're in the middle of the fight usually, right? It's, it's afterward when the, when the adrenaline comes down, that's when you start to really feel the pain that was inflicted, um, when you were, you know, in the heightened anxiety. So part of, Again, part of the reason anxiety habits, and they really are habits, they're, they're habitual ways of thinking that kind of end up painting us into a corner. Part of the reason we do them is that we get something out of them. We can get good chemicals released by being depressed. There's a reason people listen to the blues, man. Like it's, <laughs> there's, there are little treats that the rat inside of us can get by pressing these buttons. And if we're in dire enough straits, we will we will say, I want a dollar, even if I know it costs me eventually $10, but I just want that dollar now. And this is what just leaves us in worse and worse situations, always choosing the momentary benefit over the, you know, medium, short-term, long-term, um, what's the opposite of a benefit? Drawback. <laughs> so <clears throat> back to presence techniques. Another one I really like is to just screw my feet into the floor to really feel the carpet under my feet, under my toes. Now for me, one of the ways my PTSD manifests always has always, well, not always will. I hope it goes away someday is that my feet are some level of numb always. And by trying to feel with my feet, trying to feel the carpet underneath my feet as best I can, um, it helps me feel literally grounded, right? So you can feel if you're sitting down, feel the weight of your body sitting down in the chair or in the couch, feel your back pressing against the back of the couch, feel as much as you can in your physical space. Um, you know, this is why it, we don't think of it this way, but a lot of times when you're distressed and you're, you're hot and you get a popsicle or ice cold glass of water, partly what's so refreshing about that is that it is uh it's a form of pain relief it's it's not literally cooling your body down so much that you are more comfortable it's that your emotional experience of being super hot is somewhat relieved by intensely feeling the opposite sensation right does that make sense mm -hmm. so 
um, that and also uh, five things, right? You just literally open your eyes really wide, right? You can, oh, there's another thing. Take in your peripheral vision as much as you can, right? Because that's the opposite of the tunnel vision is being able to see in your peripheral vision. And so you can combine this with another exercise called the five things where it's, it's so incredibly simple. It's so simple, like it made me mad the first time I heard about it because I was like, get the F out of here with this nonsense. I have real <laughs> problems. I need real <laughs> solutions. But this one is so <laughs> sneaky good. You just look around your surroundings and you find five things, five objects, and you say them. So I would look around right now and I would say lapel mic, cell phone, notebook, bloody knife, heroin. I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, I would just name these things and it's a way of becoming more present to my physical, real surroundings rather than being solely lost to the spinning infinity that, <laughs> that is the mind, right? And it's a way of grabbing a tree branch on firm ground to prevent ourselves from just getting sucked into the quicksand. It doesn't, it usually doesn't like yank us out of the quicksand, but it can anchor us and give us a little bit of leverage with which to work. Right. So these are all tools and there's many other tools out there. Um, probably you know, far more than I've mentioned here, but these are ones that I use and that I recommend to people to get into the moment, to get into the present, to get into physical reality. And as you're breathing, as you're doing these things, every time your brain starts to kick up and start thinking and start thinking about try, trying to think its way out of the paper bag, right? Just say, no, sweetie, like we don't need to do that. You know, we don't need to flail and strain to try to outthink this because it's quicksand. We, we're not going to win this, this argument because this argument is not based in reality. It's not going to, hypochondria doesn't argue with you using logic. It uses logical fallacies. It uses rhetorical tools that bend the truth, right? You ever talk to someone who's a, like a real toxic narcissist and you try to get them to apologize for stepping on your toe? Man, they'll just go through the laundry list of gaslighting and victim blaming, and they, they will do every single thing possible to twist the reality, which is, hey, man, you stepped on my toe. You should say sorry. You should show some like some acknowledgement of that you, you know, hurt me. Um, but people, if they want to, can sit in this zone of refusal to accept reality and in that refusal, they produce these wild, but very effective rhetorical devices that are, are false. They are logical fallacies, and yet they can be so very effective. But this is the essence of propaganda. This is the essence of brainwashing, right? Stuff that kind of makes you go, well, I guess you're right, but it's not valid logic. It's not actually... It's, it's not fighting fair. And so that's what we have to remember is that we, we're going in with like good intentions, ready to square up in the middle of the ring, you know, according to Marquis of Kingsbury rules, you know, nothing below the belt, no clashing of heads. Right. And the other guy is fighting dirty, d does not consider that there's a, a rule book whatsoever. And this is why I titled this podcast, the easy way out, because in that situation, if we try to play by the rules, we lose. We lose every single time. And, and that opponent will get us to try to win the hard way where it's not playing by the rules, but we have to play by these rules. And this is why we often end up at a disadvantage. If we are willing not, not to cheat, right, but to, it feels that way to make things easy. What's the easiest way? to deal with your hypochondria. This is why I said, just tell it, okay, I'm having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what am I doing? I'm not resisting. I'm, I'm right. saying, listen, the more you get me to push against you, the more you're getting me to reify you, 
to actually make you real, even though you're not. So <clears throat> that's what we're doing. And that's what we're getting back to. We're trying to use these things and the way they move and the way they try to talk to you to point out their own delusions, their own invalid logic, their own structural, what's the word? Man, I'm trying to bring it home and I can't remember basic words. <laughs> their own structural inadequacies, the ways that if we just, we don't have to push them over because they'll blow over in a strong wind. We just have to sit back and not do anything and they fall apart. It's actually us resisting them that acts as the scaffolding that keeps them going, right? So <clears throat> we're coming up on an hour. Let's try to, uh, we don't have a hard, you know, out, but I guess we'll try to wrap it up. So yeah, when we can get present using these tools, breathing is absolutely the biggest one, but then just getting into your physical space, getting into your body via sensation, uh, this teaches us that, hey, it's okay to feel. It's okay to feel because I'm feeling the couch. I'm feeling the carpet. I'm feeling all sorts of stuff. Well, that sounds bad, but <clears throat> it's not that kind of, it's a family show. Okay. So don't <laughs> laugh at that. Um, Sorry. But uh, <laughs> but that's that's a state where we can then sit with what is actually stressing us out what is actually, you know, triggering that hopeless, catastrophizing, um, you know, seemingly powerless place that was probably born decades ago and is still inside of us frozen in fear, like a little Polaroid of the worst times. And when we can sit with it and see that for what it is, that it's not a present doom, it's just a memory of the doom that kind of crafted our whole persona, crafted all the ways that we react whenever these fears get tickled. And that we see that so much of our personality and that our identity and who we think we are is really just reactivity to this fundamentally delusional system that <laughs> runs our lives. It was responsible for our survival as a species to be ever vigilant. You know, you get attacked by a tiger once and you, you will never let that happen again. Right. Because you're like, Whoa, I barely lived through that. I need to do everything in my power to avoid that ever happening again. This is how we are still here as a species. But now in this day and age, these, fears are not founded. We don't need to be this terrified. And I think we all know that. And that's part of what makes us feel like ashamed of feeling powerless and feeling this scared when we, we know at some level we can look around and be like, everything's good. I just don't know how to convince my brain of that. And really, we don't need to try to convince our brain. We can actually let the delusion fall apart. Because again, like bringing it back around to something I said at the very beginning, we don't have to conjure up the counter argument to all this BS. We know it's BS. And if we let it be BS and we let ourselves be aware, then these things fall apart every single time. What are you thinking, man? Is that a lot? No. Yeah. I mean, but it, it's good though. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things in here. Um, I think some really good tools for me to try, but I, I think it's just one of those things where, um, I, and I know sometimes I feel bad because we've talked about this stuff before and some, and I know it's not always going to stick all the time. Um, but I just feel like there are some things that need to be reiterated with me quite a bit and then some more tools as well you know like I in those moments I feel like I, I know what I'm supposed to do but sometimes it just feels a little bit well not a little bit but really difficult or impossible to to be in the room or to be you know uh, to be present um, and I, I've noticed that breathing is a huge thing with me 
Um, and even in those moments, like I have, um, I have a smartwatch that has a breathing thing on it and I can do a three minute breathing cycle. And I've used that before, but why Awesome. laying in the bed, you know, when I don't, when I'm sitting there having a freak out, you know, I just, I can't seem to be in control um, or present. I guess maybe that's a better way to, to put it, uh, to remember, okay, you know, let's step outside of this arena for a little bit. You know, I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to do this. We're just going to find, you know, different ways to kind of deal with this. Um, so I'm really looking forward to trying these things. And and I think that I, I really do think that they'll help. Um, but there are just some times I feel like hearing it again. And I'm sure you'll probably have to tell me again somewhere down the road as well. I hope not. Um, but hearing these things uh, no, you know, time I and time again. I absolutely will. Here's the thing. Sorry, we got a little bit of a delay. I'm not trying to talk over you. Yeah, no, no, you're good. You're but, good. uh Listen, if I have to explain this to you less than 20 times, you, you will be, you will set the world record for learning something as a human being. We have to hear things over and over and over again. Here's the thing. Anxiety makes you dumb. I, I laugh about this all the time. You know, I, I don't say that in like a mean way, but I, I just laugh because I have, as I, whenever I come out of different levels of you know, delusion that run my life, I all of a sudden have these great ideas and I'm just like, whoa, that's amazing. Whoa, I just blew my own mind with what a great, you know, business idea this was. And it's something basic like buy low, sell high, <laughs> supply, demand. <laughs> and I'm just like, wait, this is really simple. Why does this feel like an earth shattering epiphany to me? It's like, well, because you, you're coming out of the, uh, you know, you're, you're clearing out the cobwebs and you're actually letting your brain work because so much of your ability to think is suppressed by anxiety, which is another reason why trying to rationalize our way out of these things isn't very helpful because we are at our weakest point rationally when we most need, you know, uh, that tool. So no, I mean, it, and this is the other thing with anybody listening, listening to this, forget the word failure. Failure is not an operative concept anymore. We are human beings. We, I come back to this one a lot, but imagine you're watching a baby learning how to walk. Imagine if the baby tried to like stand up twice and fell down and then turned to you and was like, oh man, Wes, I'm sorry you had to see that. Um, hopefully you won't have to see me fail again. You'd be like, what? No, you're a baby trying to learn how to walk. You're doing something you've never done before. What are you, nuts? That's awful. No, you're fine. This is part of the process. We would all tell that baby things that you couldn't pay us enough money in the world to tell ourselves. This process, it's okay to try and fall down and you know, deal with, with things that pop up the best you can. And then be like, I think, oh, man, I, so-and-so told me what to do, but I can't seem to think of what it is. Right. And oftentimes that can just help keep our brains like racing because we're trying to remember the game plan. And that's what, that's, what's so beautiful about just sort of shutting your mind off is that, that that's when yeah. I do all the time, right? Cause I'm the man with the plan, right? I got all these tools inside. I, I forget how many tools I have, right? That's one thing I like about coaching is I'm like, oh yeah, I actually know stuff, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> I actually have some useful stuff in my brain that I can't seem to access when I need it. But, um, <clears throat> where was I going with that? Oh, but yeah. It, trying to be successful with these things is an added pressure that is the hard way. Let's take the easy way, which is I don't have to get this right. There is no, this isn't a pass fail test. This is me experiencing emotions. And the more that that just gets to be okay, the less we're going to experience anxiety, right? Anxiety is basically, I'm not okay with this. And so much of the opposite of anxiety oftentimes is acceptance, not, you know, deep and abiding peace. You often get feelings of peace via accepting what is uncomfortable. You don't get comfort or peace by pursuing them. I think that's a C.S. Lewis quote. So, yeah. Um, 
And that's another, that's another reason why I kind of have been gravitating toward podcasts, quite honestly, just between you and me and whoever's listening, uh, because I think it is valuable. You know, I, I just released a course, the beginner's guide to losing weight, the easy way, which if you're interested in learning more about my techniques and like the things I'm teaching Wes, you know, for the price of what Wes is paying per month, you can, you can get the whole shebang. Don't tell, I should probably shouldn't tell Wes about this, but no, you've actually, you actually are in the course. Uh, I gave it to you for free. <laughs> yeah. Um, Great. Uh, how's that going? What, how far in, into it are you? Uh, I, well, Brittany and I, um, we're kind of tag teaming it a little bit. She's in the, the June challenge too. Um, we're kind of, I think we're on the fourth or fifth lesson right now. Um, and it's actually been, been really, really nice. Uh, it's something that her and I, since we, since she's a teacher as well, we both have the summers off. Um, we've been working on those things together and a lot of it, um, I, I shouldn't say a lot of it. Some of it is obviously things that we've talked about, but just to have that reiteration of things again and easily accessible, um, it's a great tool. And there are a lot of things that, uh, that I think you explain and break down, um, in a really easy way too, for me to kind of understand and remember as well. I mean, the whole way it's structured, it's great. Cool, man. I appreciate that. Um, and that's why you should give me your money because it's worth it. Trust Wes, Wesley Thunder. He's a trustworthy man. That's right. Um, no, but I appreciate that, man. And it's good to hear. Um, because what's cool about it is like part, part of the reason I gave it to, um, all my current clients is, you know, just cause I'm a nice guy, but also because, um, when we're doing coaching, we're, we're kind of following the breadcrumbs that you lay down your experience, your particular issues. Right. So I tailor what I teach you and, and where we go in this process to, you know, your particular assortment of, you know, issues for lack of a better term. Right. Gosh, these friggin' robocalls over it. <laughs> uh, but the but the beauty of the course is that you know it does set to set out to uh, basically encapsulate the first few months of coaching in course form and for far less the cost, you know, a fraction. But it does lay things out more in a you know linear organized fashion. So I was kind of hoping that, you know, if clients did go through it, they would get a bunch of stuff out of it that we haven't really talked about before, or that maybe hasn't been presented in, in sort of linear fashion. You know, we've, we've touched different parts of it. I'm sure there's, there's certain things that I say where you're like, oh man, that is word for word, what John said in our session. And then the next sentence could be something that we have literally not talked about at all. So, uh, it's interesting to hear that that is how, you know, you're experiencing it. So. Cool. Um, any last questions before we uh, say goodbye? No, no. I think you've given me a lot to a lot to work with, and I hope that anybody who's listening gets a lot out of it too. Just don't give up. Keep at it. That's right. And um, yeah, failure isn't an option. Not because you have to succeed, but because failure just literally doesn't. That's not a thing. We don't need to make it a thing. And so being free to learn and fall down, that is an essential part of freedom. If you, if you were born free, then you are free to fail. That is an essential right, as important as anything. Um, and that's super important because if we're not free to fail, we're not free to experiment. We're not free to, free to try. We're not free to tread new ground. We're not free to get out of everything that we're stuck in. So the ability to fail, if you want to phrase it that way, is the exact same thing as the ability to change your life and set out in a new direction. So Wes, Wes Thunder, Wesley Thunder, codename Thunder. <laughs> um, thank you for being so vulnerable and being willing to like share, you know, this, this is incredibly hard stuff to go through, but you know, it's uh, very commendable that you're willing to, you know, get in the hot seat and be the first guinea pig. Um, I had a feeling that this could provide like really amazing content for people to be able to get a window into like a, a coaching session. Obviously, I would like to think that our coaching sessions are a little bit more where you get to talk, 
and less where I'm just rattling off things at you. But sadly, that that is the way it goes a lot of the time. But not every client is that way. Some some clients actually let talk. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you you like it. I do. I do. It's always extremely helpful. Right on, man. Well, I will let you go. Um, thank you very much. And we will talk to you soon. All right.